Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me fine? Great, uh, welcome to week 10 session. Hi. Uh, this will be our last lecture. And in this lecture, I'm going to talk about the uh, big data mechanism and I'll give you a brief review of the, uh, of the course. Uh, big data mechanism. So uh, instead of talking about uh, uh, additional big data method, uh, we talked about uh, things like text analysis, uh, association analysis. Uh, there are so many of them. Right? And uh, every day there's new method coming out. So uh, what the problem with this method is that they are developing so fast. Right? Uh, many, many of them will be outdated in five years times. Um, so I thought you know, it's uh, more beneficial for me to discuss uh, the general mechanism behind big data, how it work, uh, how it works. Right? So that uh, uh, reason is gonna stay for longer uh, and it I think it will be helpful for you to uh, master new big data methods in the future right? and understand how it works. Right? So uh, that's why I decided to talk about the mechanism rather than more detailed methods. Uh, all these uh, new uh, trends in terms of big data now come from develop development in technologies. Right? So that uh, advances in technology has uh, changed our way of uh, now looking at the problem and dealing with them. So I summarize them, uh, summarize the change over here. First, uh, it brings new opportunity and the problems, right? Uh, like the problem I give, give you in uh, your critical thinking task. So now more and more consumers are using uh, smartphones. Uh, uh, so for, as a business owner, uh, how do you grab that uh, opportunity, right? So think, think yourself as a local department store. Uh, what does that mean to your business? What can you do uh, you, to grab that opportunity? Uh, using analytical tools. So that is your critical thinking job. But this is just a one example uh, that happens to many different ca cases in, in, in the world. And those opportunities are all bring by the advances in technologies. Uh, secondly, it changed the way we study problem. Right? In, the, uh, in the past, classical uh, statistical tools, what you would uh, typically do is that uh, I collect some data, right? I collect a sample of data. Remember the word sample here, right? It's an important word. So uh, basically you have an entire population. Right? You cannot study the entire population. So you collect a sample, a sample of the population. You try to using the sample to understand the population. Right? And because the number of data you can collect for this sample, sample is uh, generally small, a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand, but never uh, cover the large proportion of the entire population. So uh, there was a lot of error, right? Uh, data collection bias, measurement, uh, et cetera, all kinds of error exist in that small sample. So in order to best utilize that sample, you need to clean out the error. You need to understand why. Right? That's why we care about the causality so much, because by understanding the logic behind uh, the, what, what we observe in this small data set, we are more confident that uh, using this small data, we understand the entire population. Right? Uh, so that, that's the small data world logic right? uh, or the tri a classical statistical logic. However, we, with big data, if you can collect the, um, if your sample, right, your sample is the entire population, or no, a large proportion of the po population, then uh, causality becomes less important. Uh, in, if your goal is to predict, 
I will talk about it. If you are going to design, etc., reason is still important. And for the long run, it's still important. But for your short-term prediction, uh, all you need is correlation, right? Or uh, whatever data helps you that uh, uh, to improve your prediction uh, power, they, they are good, good data, right? You can use them to help you with short-term prediction. So uh, that, that means you now the data, data source you use, uh, the way you collect the data will, will change, right? Uh, the, you, you use it to scan the, every, the barcode of all the product you sell, right? But now with, uh, you know, for example, more mobile phone we, we use, uh, we are sending out the data every second uh, we are holding our device, right? So the problem is how you collect them and utilize them, right? So, <laughs> The way you do sample is no longer uh, several hundred people. Uh, you need to uh, do some random assignment, et cetera, to ensure the data quality, right? But if you can cover a larger proportion, then it's a lesser issue. Right? Also, because of the uh, number, amount of data, the way you analyze the data also change, right? And uh, you are going to utilize the re result in for example, real time. That means a new way of utilizing the result as well. Uh, the mechanism behind the data, data, many people summarize them as, uh, for example, three Vs or four Vs. Now uh, you can see ver various versions, but uh, most of they are talking about the volume. Uh, that's the uh, that's where big data come from, right? And uh, they also talk about the velocity and the variety. Right? But, but to me, uh, big data maximum, for the big data maximum to, to work, there are some additional items. I, I list six of them here, and I'd like to uh, explain them in this session. First, the volume. Right? Volume is huge. I, uh, you will be amazed how, how much data has been collected. Right? So this is a, a, a chart from 2015, actually, right? five years ago. But even at that time, you can see how many data have been collected. Now, like, a, like a Google, right? Google process 3.5 billion requests per day. Right? Uh, in, even in 2009, they were was preparing to have over one exabyte of data. What is exabyte, right? And one exabyte is about 1,000 petabyte. And the one petabyte is uh, uh, about 1,000 terabyte, right? <laughs> terabyte. So that, that so uh, now, nowadays a typical you know, portable drive, uh, they are one terabyte or two terabyte, right? So think about a million terabytes that is, uh, uh, one exabyte. So it's estimated that Google is now uh, at 2015, uh, collect over 10 exabytes of data. I see the amount of, of them is huge. Right? Uh, and Amazon even uh, you no know, uh, shopping <laughs> website, right? shopping website, how much data they collect. Right? One exabyte of data, right? On average of one megabyte per object that they have in there. In the online store, right? that that is a lot, right? For the, uh, each item, they have one megabyte data. So, uh, so think, uh, the, try to get a sense, right? So, uh, what does this amount of data mean, right? So, let, let's say this is a uh, ten billion uh, gigabyte of data Google store in two thousand fifteen, right? So, assume we have uh, three billion internet users and they all use Google. Which is not true. <laughs> a large proportion do not use it. Uh, for example, users from China, China uh, they do not use Google, right? Uh, but let's say everyone, three billion, uh, you use Google. That means how how much per person? Right? That is uh, three gigabyte of data per person, right? And if you transfer that into transaction, right? You, you remember the number of record I gave you in the data file, in the team project data file, right? Check how large the data it is, right? Think about this, instead of uh, several megabytes, uh, this data is uh, three gigabytes. How many records will it have? Uh, it will have about one 
million transaction record. And uh, uh, about yourself, now, can you remember the last 10 transactions you did? Uh, it's hard for me, it's hard for me. Uh, so everyone of us, we uh, cannot even remember the past 10 transactions we made, but Google knows 10 million transactions we have made. All right. So that include those things we buy, include our uh, the keywords you search, right? uh, URL you access, your credit card information, your email, all, all of this, right? one million transaction records. So I think it's uh, uh, at some point it's fair to say that uh, uh, Google knows us better than we do. <laughs> so uh, why large matters? Right? Uh, so it puzzles me for uh, for some time because uh, my, even myself for uh, some time because uh, large. Uh, what does large mean, right? Uh, in terms of statistical method, that means no need to sample. That means no sampling error. Because of, because of no sampling error, it allows us to do more. So for example, uh, uh, there's some noise. Uh, let me mute, mute uh, other, uh, all other people. Now, if you want to ask me a question, you can turn, turn it on or type uh, in the chat box. Right, thanks. Um, where were we? So what large means? Right? So for, for example, there, here's uh, the two examples over here. Now, a classical study will say in Australia, for example, 35 to 40 years old man like T-shirt, uh, like blue t-shirt pants, right? I'm wearing a blue shirt today. Huh? So, so we have a customer who is 38 uh, years old. It's likely that this person will like blue t-shirt. So let's uh, offer a blue t-shirt to him, right? Uh, but big data takes a different approach. It says, no, we uh, feed all the information we have. Not about 30 to 40 years, but all information about 30, 80 years old people, uh, uh, men, uh, uh, men, I, uh, because we have so many data, uh, we got enough information we need. We feed them into the system. Uh, and then come, uh, we also know uh, this particular customer's own data, uh, all, all things ab about him, uh, and uh, put all this, this together. Then we can precisely calculate calculate. Um, the system tells us this person, uh, this particular person has a uh, 67% six, of chance to buy our number three t-shirt. Right? It's not about the blue t-shirt. It's not about, uh, it's our specific number three uh, t-shirt. Right? So, uh, so let's offer the, that t-shirt to, to him. So this is a power that, that the large amount of data gives you. Uh, some more example, right? Uh, I like this metaphor uh, a, a lot. Uh, so quantitative change will eventually lead to qualitative change. As we accumulate enough data, uh, it uh, actually changes the picture. Right? So think about uh, uh, taking photos, right? those pictures to, to a movie. A uh, movie, if you know how it's made, right? it's essential, essentially a series of pictures you uh, to play them very quickly. Right? So if you take a picture of a horse, right, you have a stacked view of, of the horse. But if you take 24 photos per second continuously and play them continuously, then you have the movement of the whole course. Right? The movement of the, uh, of the horse is some new information that you do not get from a, st a static view of the horse. So that is a good example of a quantitative change leads to qualitative change. Uh, because it's a bit hard to understand, I give you more example here. Uh, this is a Microsoft Grammar Checker. I, I'm sure many of you know, know this. Um, so they developed four algorithms and a f uh, feed, uh, they, they give a try, right? Uh, feed 10 million, 100 million, 1 billion words to each of the four algorithms, see how, how it works. Clearly now, 
uh, all algorithm improves when you increase your, your data, right? That's, that's for sure. However, uh, the best algorithm with small amount of data, for example, 10 million, right? Uh, the increase rate is only from 86% accuracy to 94%, right? Uh, it's still good. But interestingly, the worst algorithm with small data, when you're feeding good data, is actually becomes the best algorithm in the big data world. And it increased from 75% accuracy to 95% accuracy. Right? So clearly, this uh, best algorithm with small data is more about understanding the logic behind it, understanding the reason. Right? But the, big data, uh, the best algorithm with big data uh, does not really care about why people say this word, you use this word in, in such a way. I only care about uh, you know, uh, whether I can predict it right or wrong based on huge amount of 1 billion words. Right? Uh, so that becomes the best, best algorithm. Another example, no, quantitative, cha quant quantitative change leads to qualitative change. So uh, another example. Right? <laughs> Google Translation. I'm not sure if you use Google Translation uh, before. I, I tried it uh, uh, five, 10 years ago. I, I also tried it, tried it now. And I, I personally feel the translation accuracy increase a lot. I, uh, I, don't, I don't speak as a language, but I speak both English and Chinese. So I give it a try. Um, the accuracy improved a lot. There's still room to improve, but uh, improved a lot. It's, it's because the uh, algorithm have improved, but also because they feed more and more da data to, to improve it. Right? So uh, they use millions of pages to train their algorithm, which, which makes the algorithm more and more accurate. They can even translate language which no one in the team <laughs> speaks. So uh, it's, they, they also say now the accuracy increase every time a linguistic leaves a team. Uh, th this of course is a joke, but uh, uh, you, you need to think, think about the why this happened, right? So uh, actually uh, it's not uh, because people leave accuracy increase, it's because accuracy, accuracy increase, they no longer need to hire linguistics. Right? Only people from computer science uh, who can write the algorithm is enough. People who understand the language is no longer necessary right? because the, uh, because the algorithm is already good enough to, to make a translation. So that's the first feature, right? big volume. The second feature, I think uh, it's very, very important uh, to many companies to understand big data. Because uh, many companies, they do have a lot of data. Right? For example, a company I, I worked with, they sit on, sit on like, like 65 millions of transaction record. Uh, that's a huge amount of data. Right? The volume is large, but uh, I was not able to help them too much with that data set because that data set is very uh, thin. Right? It's not a rich data set. Right? What do I mean by that? Here's multiple uh, sources, different informations uh, that makes your data rich. Because the data set they have, the six, 65 million record, uh, they are about the same thing. Right? Every day, who buys, uh, every day, they know what product got sold at what time, at what price, that's it. They don't even know uh, the person who buys it to have any information. They don't have any information on that. Right? They also uh, cannot link other source of information together, which makes the data very, very long, but very thin, not rich enough for them to act too much on that. Of course, I, with uh, uh, models I have, I, still, I, I was still able to uh, help them do something, but uh, the power of the uh, method is certainly limited by the richness of the data. So, uh, so the second feature I'd like to talk about is use multiple source of data now to enrich your uh, 
data set, make it a richer uh, information source. So th this also uh, a word if you heard about the data fusion, right? fuse uh, the data together. Uh, for example, uh, combining text analysis in your product design, right? So you you get um, you know your how to design uh, air conditioner, right? You have all kind of set of data on one side. Now you have some additional source. Right? That is what people uh, search the question people search on search engine. And then you uh, extracted the two pieces of information here, for example, uh, using text analysis. Right? So the air from the air conditioner is too cold. Right? Where can I buy air conditioner that do not blow cold air on you? Right? You know, in the summer, we want to use the, uh, the air conditioner, but the, the air is too, too cool. Right? So that is customer need. On top of all your knowledge about how to build air conditioner, now you combine customers' needs, uh, fresh needs at the current, current moment, right? Uh, you learn from search engine. Then you can make something happen, right? So this is from uh, higher right? uh, uh, air, air conditioner manufacturer. Right? So based on that, they produce this smart air conditioner. Right. So the, to address the needs stated above. So the, uh, the approach is that uh, you see the uh, hole over here, right? So the, the cold air blow within the hole. Uh, so before it blows out, it will mix with the uh, room air. Uh, after mixture, it will uh, now, uh, now increase the uh, temperature a bit and not directly the cold air on you, but gradually mixing the cold air from the machine and the warm air uh, from, from the room and temporarily uh, drop the, de decrease the temperature in, in the room, all right? Uh, so this is a good example of uh, bringing different sources. Another example, uh, also from higher, uh, so it's about com combining search engine data with sales data right, to minimize storage. So they found that 5% uh, of people who search uh, air conditioner will buy. And on average, it takes 2.5 days from search to buy. Right? So now you know uh, how many people are searching uh, on on internet? You also also know your sales data. How I, can you utilize that to uh, create some profit for you? Right? You know those white goods. Uh, white goods. A large proportion of cost come from storage. Right? Because things. Uh, too big, right? You need to hire a lot of space to uh, to store your product, but you also need to make sure your product is there when customer come to buy it. Otherwise, they would just leave leave you and buy from another manufacturer, right? So your product needs to be there, but uh, being there takes a lot of cost, storage cost. However, using uh, combining these two pieces of information, you can dramatically reduce your uh, storage cost. So this is what Hire did. So they find out how many people search at different locations, different cities, for example. Right? Then they set up the uh, delivery delivery from the manufacturer to the location. Right? Uh, the delivery number right, is 5% times the search number. Right? And delivery time is exactly 2.5 days later uh, at the time of calculation. Right? So in, in that way, uh, they make, the, uh, make their logistic chain a lot more flexible, right? response timely uh, to, to the end of the logistic line, uh, which saves them a huge amount of cost. Right? Uh, this the data fusion uh, sounds complicated, but uh, it does not take uh, Rock the science, right? and uh, here you know uh, understanding what's going on, the, the reason there, and being smart to put pieces together is important. A good example where you both use big data, data technology, you know, and use your uh, re reasoning to 
uh, understand the why and make it happen. Right? For example, uh, it's it has been uh, a couple of years ago, right? So when Obama was uh, Obama was uh, uh, running for U.S. Pre president, so Paul says, you "No, know, uh, Obama needs some help with mid-age female voters." Right? And uh, for mid-age female voters, who do they like? Now they they are crazy for George Clooney, right? So they set up a meeting like this. Uh, to, to help Obama uh, among middle-aged uh, female voters. Right? Uh, so, and it uh, appears to be successful. Uh, third, uh, velocity. Right? Velocity uh, here, here most of the time means uh, a real-time, uh, real-time action. So uh, you get your result, utilize your result in real time. So this is a piece of research that uh, one of my co-authors at MIT did. Uh, they uh, worked with a British uh, telecom company. Hi. So the question here is, uh, I have different plans to show customer, but the customers have different uh, flavors for, for the plan. Hi. Some want very brief information like this one. Hi. Some want very complicated information. They need to know every bit uh, details of the plan, right? So the question is, uh, uh, which, which version of plan should I show my customer? And remember now, these are new customers, right? We, haven't, we don't know too much about them yet. Right? We need to quickly predict at the time they come to our website, we need to predict what kind of uh, web pages they will prefer will increase their likelihood of purchase. Right? So that, that is a problem. So they developed this uh, uh, method called the web, uh, website morphing, right? and they developed uh, eight different versions like here. Right? Uh, they use some click streams. Right? So you go to the website, and uh, the, you click some place, uh, look at a different place. They use this click uh, streams to predict which of the eight morphs that you like best and offer that morph to you. Apparently, it increased people's intention to, to buy a lot, right? As a result, they, they increased 52 millions in revenue. This is uh, one of the biggest uh, 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 telecom company in UK now, uh, but still this uh, 52 million is a huge amount of money, right? Um, they also did some uh, uh, experiment uh, shows that if they know consumers cognitive style, right, cognitive style, so they, how, how they process information, what kind of information they need to, uh, for them to make a decision. Right? If they know, know that, then they will uh, be able to further increase, increase another 27 million uh, in, in revenue. Right? That means more accurate prediction of what customers want to see. Now, this is an example of React in time. Uh, uh, the third V, variety, right? variety. All kinds of uh, data can, can help us make decisions. Right? In the past, we only look at numbers, right? But now we look at, for example, taxes, uh, for example, network associations we did last week, right? Um, here is the example. So uh, there was a big problem in New, New York because it's a very expensive city, right? uh, more expensive than Sydney. Right? So there's an illegal conversion. Uh, they cutting up a big room into small cells that ran out. Right? It creates uh, um, a higher risk for fire and a crime. So uh, they uh, hire some inspectors to handle this case. Right? But now they, there were only 200 inspectors and the estimate amount is 25,000 illegal conversions. So how, how do they handle this? Right? Uh, apparently they are short of manpower here. So they use all kinds of data uh, and pull them together with a big data model. Right? So including, for example, tax payment, uh, utility usage and payment, type of building, am ambulance visit, crime rates, uh, rodent complaints, etc. Right? And uh, 
uh, they were able to increase the predicted accuracy from 13% to 70%. Uh, why those variables can lead to a better prediction? They don't really know. <laughs> they, uh, frankly, they don't really care. As long as your model can help me predict uh, the illegal conversion 70% right, that's increase my efficiency, right? Efficiency at least five times, right? Uh, that's good enough. I don't need to know, uh, know why. Right? Some variable like a, a, a recent brickwork. Uh, recent brickwork becomes a good pre predictor for this. Right? But now uh, for the model, we really don't need to understand why. Uh, but usually when you have a variable that actually works, there's uh, typically some reason behind it. Right? So because in the, in, the, uh, in the real world, it's still now people do things for a reason. Right? For example, recent brick work is a good variable because you know, for those illegal conversions, they don't really uh, care about uh, how their uh, apartment or house look like, right? So they will not bother to do <laughs> some reason, uh, some br brick work. It you know, uh, looks like they fine you know, as long as we can live in there fine. Uh, so as, as if this house or apartment owner is care enough to bring out reason to brick work, it's less likely that there's illegal conversions in there. Right? So there are actually some reasons behind that, uh, perhaps behind each of them. Right? Uh, but when you put together so sources, which one is a better predictor, which one is a dominant reason, is there any latent reason behind these variables? Uh, there, there are, but we don't see that in the model and we don't really care. Right? As long as the prediction is accurate. Right? So uh, this is a network example, right? So uh, like uh, uh, f Facebook, right? Facebook have uh, know what kind of, uh, what friend you have, right? Uh, what, uh, what kind of post you like? And uh, for the, the same post, now there's some other people who also like this post, right? So here, this is, uh, 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 this, uh, this is uh, a Star Wars. Star Wars Facebook page, right? So green, green spot, uh, some post, and around some post you can see people connected to that, replied to that that post, and uh, uh, easily you can see you now there's a few topics and naturally group people into among uh, uh, into five groups over here, right? Uh, based on their interest in Star Wars post. Right. So then you know your users better, right? Uh, Facebook, uh, at, uh, a few years ago, they uh, increased their number of emoji. Right? It used to be like and love, but now there's a uh, ha ha, wall, sad, angry as well. Right? Uh, why do they do that? Because uh, they can, through that, they can understand you better, understand your emotion better. Right? So uh, then they can, send the targeting advertisement to you. <laughs> um, so this, this is another example of uh, using network right, uh, to control drug use, right? because uh, uh, this is a case from um, uh, US, a, a small town called Colorado Spring. Right? Uh, so they observe uh, the drug users, which is a dot, uh, red dot over here, right? they have the connections of uh, drug users, person to person, because the dr uh, drug is uh, very uh, interesting stuff. You, if you want to use drug, you need to get drug, right? So you have to connect with other drug dealer or other drug, drug users. And by observing this network, uh, uh, they can find out who is a key person right? uh, in a sub network. Uh, for, exa for example, here, right? so this sub network, you can see now this person, th this person is a, is a one that connected this small network to the rest of the big network. So if you have limited police power and you can only take out a few people out of network in order to control the drug, now this kind of person is the one you need to 
lock them in the cell, right? They're more likely to be the drug dealer. Uh, if you lock them up, then the other people don't have drugs to, to buy. And naturally, uh, you can better control your drug use. Now, uh, next one is uh, machine learning. Right? We talk about uh, uh, three, uh, three Vs, but how to actually make things work, right? Make things work. Is that uh, you news, uh, need to use the power of latest uh, development in computer science? Computer science. So uh, we talk about this uh, example at the very beginning, right? Uh, so your, your uh, uh, target knows uh, your daughter is pregnant before you do, right? But how the, do they do that? Right? After the uh, lecture last week, I hope now you get a sense how they did it, right? So they clearly they did some associate association analysis, right? So people who uh, buy odorless uh, body lotion, right, switch their pattern. Actually, it's more complicated than the simple example we did last week. So if you observe people switch from their normal body lotion to an odorless uh, body lotion, at the same time, they are female at a certain age range, all this information combined will predict, will, will be associated that later, they will buy some uh, baby stuff, right? So that, that is why Target knows uh, this high school girl was pregnant. And then based on that, they send out uh, catalogs to, to the uh, girl. Right? So this method was originally uh, used by uh, Walmart. Right. And the one classical case is uh, uh, people like to buy diapers and beer together. Right. Why diapers and beer together? Uh, I'm not sure how many of you hear about this, uh, but this becomes a very uh, fa fam famous ca case in uh, business education. Right. Thanks to this uh, the, uh, business teachers like me, now, now many people know knows about that. Um, you can guess why people buy uh, diaper and beer together. Right? The thing is that uh, uh, husband like me, right? So my wife say, you know, so, something go out and buy, buy some diapers, right? So then I go, uh, I go and uh, buy some di diapers. Then I feel, you no, know, I'm, uh, I'm doing something good for my family, right? So I should reward myself as well. <laughs> so on the way to get some di diaper, I buy some beer to get a beer for myself. Uh, apparently, uh, that was actually the, the reason why people buy diaper and beer together. But uh, machine learning, like uh, association analysis, right? So they find, find out that association. They don't understand why they don't really care. But based on that, you can put diapers and beer together to make it easier for people like me to buy diaper and uh, pick, up, pick up beer together. <laughs> well, sometimes I uh, initially didn't think about uh, uh, buy some beer, but because they are together so close, it's kind of re reminded myself, right? Just kind of uh, shouting to me, hey, something, you did something good. You deserve some beer. So buy some beer together, <laughs> things like that. And thanks to business school teachers, now, now your friend also know, right? So your baby shower becomes like that, right? <laughs> baby product. and. Uh, beer as well. They also find out that uh, when hurricane came, right? hurricane came, uh, people need to buy some product related to hurricane. Right? This time you're combining the weather information with your uh, sales record. Right? So now, now you know when the hurricane came, came uh, what kind of product customer needs to buy. So you can put them uh, at the front of your store easily for people to pick up. Right. Uh, apparently, it's called a pop tart. <laughs> pop tart. Pop tart is uh, uh, quite American style food. Very, very sugary, very sweet uh, stuff. It's a, a breakfast snack, right? Uh, so for whatever reason, I uh, I don't know for sure. <laughs> but when hurricane came, people like to buy pop tart. They even know which flavor people like most. Right? You can guess which one. <laughs> which one they like best. 
is this the strawberry one. Uh, strawberry is the one they, they like best. Uh, so uh, the machine learning is on the uh, computer side, how to make it work. Right? But on the other hand, you still need to combine different data sources together. How do you know they are for, from the same person, right? Uh, that uh, we need to talk about the digital footprint. Right? So where, wherever you browse, you use some, uh, your smartphone, you're sending out your identity. Right. So using this identity, people can co combine different things you do, now merge those data sources together. So for example, this, uh, this is, uh, uh, at some stage I was uh, searching for uh, the, this uh, memory card uh, for, for my uh, di digital camera. Right. Uh, so I, uh, I went to office work right, and uh, so search for this uh, Sandisk 32 gigabyte. Uh, memory card. Right. One second later, on another website, I, uh, I, I did an experiment. Right? I close office work, then the next second I go to another website I frequently visit right? because English my, is my second language. I try to make sure that, uh, that my pronunciation is correct. So uh, I use this website called howjsay.com. Uh, they have a lot of advertisement. Right? It's uh, if you speak English as a second language. I think it's a fairly good website, but the one thing is that it has too many advertisements. <laughs> and just one second ago, I searched this. Uh, one sec second later, you I see the items I searched on this website. Uh, I think they used the, the cookie, uh, cookie in my internet browser to uh, deliver that information to the, this, how do you say, uh, .com website. So they find out, oh, it's the, song, the same person who just uh, uh, searched a 32 gigabyte uh, memory, uh, memory card. So I should offer him all the advertisement to relate to them, right? So it's here, right? it's here as well. Right? Uh, on top of uh, this uh, golden one, I have silver one as well, right? Silver one here, silver one here. Uh, somehow they also find out People who search this one will also have a high, uh, higher likelihood to buy some other stuff like uh, this uh, blue, Bluetooth earpiece, like a mouse. Uh, maybe at some earlier stage, I even searched these uh, uh, items. I, I just don't remember myself, but they still <laughs> remember it, right? So they show, show this to me again. So I was, I was thinking, oh, uh, wow, that's, that's, that's quick. And uh, how much uh, was my identity leaked, right? So uh, if I use a different browser, what will happen? So I used IE, uh, Internet Explorer, which I uh, never use, <laughs> which I never, never use on my computer. So when I use IE, all these, all these uh, uh, ads about the memory card disappear. Right? <laughs> uh, the same time, at uh, the same time, I, uh, visit the same website, but uh, all these advertisements based on my search result disappear. But somehow they still get some of my information because uh, you can see here now the big data definition. <laughs> big data definition. I can hardly imagine uh, a typical uh, a typical internet user now. Ninety nine percent of people will uh, search for big data definition. Right? It must be some of my uh, computer use makes me think that uh, uh, this may interest me, which is indeed correct. Right? Uh, so uh, my conclusion was that when I ch changed different browser, my personal information was not leaked that much, but uh, anyway, uh, some part of it has already <laughs> leaked as well. <laughs> Uh, I guess nowadays it's very hard to avoid that. So this is uh, uh, your real footprint uh, mapped uh, based on your smartphone use. Right? Uh, so uh, you, you may you may get amazed. So like a Google Google Map, right? You can show uh, they can show how traffic is going on in front of you. 
right? So then you can better plan your route. It's a com very convenient uh, for you, but uh, how do they know? How do they know there's a lot of people over there and how fast they move? Uh, because they are all using uh, Android uh, smartphones, right? So uh, believe me, <laughs> your, when you start to use Android phones, there's a long list of agreement, which we have to agree in order to use. And uh, no one actually reads. Somewhere in that long list, you have already consent <laughs> for Google to use your data for, for prints over here. So as long as you use an uh, use an Android phone, uh, even if you do not turn on your uh, Google Map, you're still giving away your location information. And this is not just about uh, just uh, Google, right? Uh, other smart smartphones like Apple users, right? don't laugh. You give out your information as well. Uh, Windows phone users, uh, as long as you are using smartphone. Uh, most likely you are giving out your information in real time. All right. uh, so this is a map, a map of one person's footprint. Right? And uh, every, for example, every one minute or even 10, 10 seconds, uh, we have uh, a collect a data point. Right? And based on data point, you can infer a lot of things. Right? So for example, this person spent a lot of time in this area. Uh, this is Melbourne, by the way. Right. This person perhaps walked along this road, right? Even without machine learning, if you use my naked eye, I can find that out, right? And uh, here you see why there's a, such a long way over here and uh, some stop over here. Now, most likely this person took bus or drive a car. There are some traffic stops over here. Over here. Uh, so this per person drive a car or take a bus over here, uh, maybe park somewhere, start to spend some time over here, here go along this street. Um, so, you know, I can infer a lot of information right, with my naked eye. So this digital footprint is uh, very, very useful. Right? At some stage, I will uh, not be surprised if uh, uh, I walk by uh, advertisement post and uh, it's, uh, the advertisement over there is tailored based on my preference. Right? That's completely possible. And I can see that happening uh, even in a few years. Right. So these features, these features all make our big data work. Right? Or the, uh, the big data uh, makes, uh, they leads to the change in how we find out new opportunities, create new solutions, how to collect data, how to utilize implement solutions. All, right. all these are affected. Uh, all right, uh, so before we move on, uh, let's take a five minutes break. Then we will come back and uh, talk about the can, as can, can and cannot of big data. Let's do a five minutes break. All right, uh, let's come back to lecture. All right. So I just uh, talked about uh, uh, the mechanisms uh, that uh, uh, make big data work. Uh, uh, now I'd like to talk about the can and cannot of big data. Uh, so big data is uh, uh, good at knowing what is. Uh, when you have, where you have a lot of data, uh, if something has already happened and you have already collected the data, uh, well, they, they are very, very good. Right? But they are not good at knowing what is not. Right? So if things had, did not happen, right? or you know, the, in your statistical models, those insignificant results, where it uh, perhaps should happen but didn't, didn't happen, which is also informative, right? but big data does not know that, because if the things has not happened, there's no data. No data means uh, you don't know. You don't know. Uh, another thing is that they know uh, of, uh, oh, example about the, what is not. Right? Like new customers and new, uh, new product, new ideas, new environmental context. But then big data uh, don't know what's going on. 
right? Because it never, never happened. Right? Um, also, uh, big data is good at knowing what is going on, but not why. Now that we have talked about a lot. So they only care about the prediction accuracy, only care about the correlation, right? but not the reason behind this. Uh, because of that, uh, you know, in time-wise, time big data is good for short-term prediction. However, in the long-term prediction, you can, you can see uh, it will be hard for big data. Well, actually it will be hard for both, but the understanding of why gives you a better leverage to, predict, to look a little bit further uh, than a very short-term uh, short goal. So that is uh, two, uh, two major things. Uh, example, example. Uh, this, so this is uh, uh, actually big data, both success and failure. Uh, I'm not sure if you know this. Uh, uh, Google tries to predict the flu virus spread using the search terms. It was a huge success in 2009. Uh, so they basically based on people's search engine um, key, keywords, they were able to predict where, uh, how fast the flu was, will spread. Right? Uh, it's as accurate as the CDC, right? the Center for Disease Control. I'm, I'm sure nowadays you perhaps heard that a lot. Um, it was good, good at, uh, at that time. Right? It, as accurate as them, but much faster. The CDC was like one or two weeks later, right? but Google was real time. It was very good. However, when flu happens again in 2013, right, the Google tried to predict again, right? uh, but actually uh, this, they failed this time. They predicted 10.6% of visits to, to doctors, but the actual number was only 4.5%. Why? Why? <laughs> Why? So uh, because a new uh, context happened. Because, because, because of their success in 2009, people now know uh, Google is very useful to predict the flu spread. So many people go to Google uh, to, and use Google to find out how flu is spreading, <laughs> which makes uh, now unexpected high volume of search on Google. And now as a result, they mistakenly predict uh, too high volume of uh, flu spread. Right? So new situation happens, the big data have not have, they have not have those data in their data set, right? So they don't know what has not been observed, all right? So this is why. Um, Cross-selling, right? that is one important uh, uh, concept in, in marketing. So you can see uh, the, the data says now 70% of customers who buy A also buy B, right? And there are other 30% people who buy A but did not buy B, right? So you know, there's a different approach, uh, different, different method will tell you. With big data, they will tell you, hey, now 70% 70, 70 is a large confidence, right? Uh, so let's uh, promote product B to other 30% customer as well. But by saying that, think about it. You are making some assumption. Right? You're assuming that all, all this uh, other 30% people who also want to buy B, it's just because they didn't see it or for some other, other reason. Well, that's why you know, promotion to B uh, makes it work. However, a classical approach will try to understand why those 30% people didn't buy. Right? If they are, um, not aware of product B, then you should promote it to, to, to this 30% of customer. Well, if there are two segments, they're just another segment of 30% people, and then promoting B to this customer just uh, won't work, all right? So understanding uh, why helps you make your decision actually uh, better, make your decision process better. So big data, this is a joke written about uh, uh, big data, right? So this is largely about the mechanism, uh, machine learning mechanism used for 
uh, dealing with big data pro problem. So this is like a pile of algorithms, right? So this person says, is, uh, is this your machine learning system? Uh, yeah, you pull, pull data into this end and then uh, uh, into this big pile of linear algebra then collect the answer over there, right? And this person, what if the answer are wrong? Then just stir the pile <laughs> until they start looking right. <laughs> Uh, because this is a big black box. You don't really know what's exactly in there. Even the person who built this model don't, don't know why the, uh, the, the details of how this model, model works. Uh, it's called the interpretability, why things works, because a weakness of, of big data model. Uh, so big data, uh, looks fancy, but it's not the solution for every problem. It suits a certain type of pro uh, uh, problems. At the same time, uh, many other problems needs a thorough understanding of why. Uh, in those ca cases, like those classical method should be should be used. And here is an example: uh, traditional research method shines. Uh, so this the. Uh, I, I'm not sure if you heard, uh, heard about this uh, product. It's a famous product called the Viagra. Right? It's uh, a deal with erectile dysfunction uh, treatment. Right? So uh, that the product itself was, uh, uh, was a very, very interesting case as well. Right? Uh, it's not related to big data, but the repositioning of the product. Right? So the Viagra was initially designed to treat uh, hypertension, uh, that is high blood pressure. Right? Then they find this side effect. <laughs> so, so the main effect is to cheat hypertension, right? But uh, uh, they find this uh, side effect which can be used to treat erectile dysfunction. Then they smartly reposition the product from hypertension to erectile dysfunction. Apparently, this side effect treatment <laughs> is much more profitable than its main uh, main purpose. Right? So it was a huge success. Right? But now, uh, then there's a similar product that come out, new product, uh, just a few years, right? Uh, come out at the uh, market called the Cialis. Right? Cialis. Well, they similarly they treat uh, erectile dysfunction. But uh, as a new product, uh, they come to research questions, say, a uh, manager problem, uh, how should I come position myself to compete with Viagra, right? So they did some, uh, some research, they did some research. You know, it, uh, Viagra position, you now the positioning of the product is to, uh, for men, right? Uh, all, all the advertisement is about men themselves. I, I will sh show you two, two commercials uh, in the, the uh, next, next slides. But now everything about the Viagra advertisement about men, I'll make you look more men, right? Uh, so that is what Viagra is about. But Cialis, right? they took a different approach. They study the market and so, oh, well, there's a man market, but there's another market called the we market, right? Because this uh, takes uh, two lovers, uh, uh, participants, right? So no, you're only focusing on one end, but uh, what about a couple? Is there any uh, market in the we market rather than me market or man market, right? Uh, so, they did a research and how do they find out this idea? You cannot get that idea based on existing data because existing data, uh, they're all from men, right? So the product users, buy, uh, buyers, the doctor who see their patients, the patients, they're all dealing with men problem. Right? They will not tell you something else, but uh, this, uh, uh, Ali Lilly company, when they do research, they study the women as well, right? And they discover that this we market is actually twice as large as a me market. So it was a huge success. Just in a few years, in this erectile dysfunction treatment market, Cialis becomes a market leader, right? Although Viagra has been there for a long time, right? So you can, uh, 
I have two uh, interesting uh, commercials for you. All right, first, let's look at this uh, Cialis com commercial. commercial is always about a couple, right? It's always a we in the, uh, in, in, in the advertisement. But comparatively, you know, uh, Viagra commercial is always about men. Let me show, show you another one. So this is not a direct uh, uh, Viagra commercial, right? So uh, you guys know this uh, Ellen DeGeneres show, right? So this is uh, Ellen's show about uh, a new Viagra commercial where they, for the first time uh, forever, <laughs> they, they used a women spokes, uh, spokesperson in their uh, advertisement. Right? But uh, you can see it's still about men. <laughs> Number two, every other commercial is for Cialis. So in this show, uh, she makes fun of both uh, Cialis uh, uh, commercial and uh, uh, Viagra commercial, but, but you can see how, uh, how she uh, jokes about it and uh, sees a di different position of these two brands. Is they show couples doing activities together, and the husband gets in the mood. Uh, doing, you know, some of the activities are normal. Tennis, you see the tennis, you know, and then he hits her on her butt. You know, it's, it's the beginning of knowing he's in the mood when it goes. Then there's random activities like, have you seen the painting the bench? They're paint, or they're pretending to paint a bench. There's nothing on the brush. There, and he's really turned on by that. Take a look. You make a great team. It's been that way since the day you met. But your erectile dysfunction, it could be a question of blood flow. Cialis Tadalafil for daily use helps you be ready anytime the moment's right. You can be more confident in your ability to be ready. If that turns him on, what doesn't? Actually, I can't tell if it, it, seeing his wife painting a bench gets him excited or he needs to take Cialis or if he already took it and the Cialis is kicking in at the wrong time. And then the, the new, uh, have you seen the Viagra commercial? They hired a woman for the fir first time. They have a woman uh, a spokesperson and she is very, very blunt. So guy, it's just you and your honey. Setting is perfect. But then erectile dysfunction happens again. You know what? Plenty of guys have this issue, not just getting an erection, but keeping it. Well, Viagra helps guys with ED get and keep an erection. And you only take it when you need it. Ask your doctor if Viagra is right for you. So, she's British. She can make anything sound classy, but... Um... I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, but Viagra originally asked me to do uh, the commercial and be their spokesperson. And I, I did it and I thought it went well, but I guess they decided to go with her. But um, here's the commercial that I made for them. Hello, men. It's me, Ellen DeGeneres. Your 
business, and I'll be honest with you, I don't have an accent. And when it comes to your downstairs area, I don't know how any of it works, and frankly, I don't care. But wake up, sleepy Joe is a nightmare. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Plenty of men can't get their noodles al dente. Soldier won't salute. Then by it's for you. Sure, there's lots of problems in the world: crime, the economy, global warming. But this is important. We need to fix your. All you need is one of these little blue pills. I fell off the bed. But I have to warn you: if you have dizziness, difficulty sleeping, or if you're Cobra remains charmed for more than four hours. Please, please see a doctor. So, if you think Viagra is right for you, talk to your doctor or your health care provider. Just don't talk to me about it. Yucky. This show, show you can, uh, because it's interesting to work. Uh, but now from this, uh, this show, you can also get a sense how women, how women will. Uh, view the Viagra position of the, uh, the their product, right? And uh, uh, from that that ad attitude, I can I can see that this uh, uh, we market is uh, perhaps a lot larger than uh, me, uh, me market, right? Um, so this is where traditional uh, re research shines because uh, uh, now as a product who all your data are gather gather is about men. Uh, Frankly, you, you will not be able to find that in your data. So uh, there was a time. Uh, so on the internet, uh, no one knows you, uh, your dog. So this is one fa famous cartoon uh, made on uh, the uh, New York collection. Uh, I think it's perhaps the most, somewhere I learned this is the uh, highest cited um, cartoon made, right? but then there's some follow up. Right? So now, now, nowadays, now of course they, they know your dog, your shopping pattern gives away. Right? Uh, so with big data, we learn a lot about customer. Right? But there's some something behind this. Right? Uh, do people actually know your dog uh, based on your shopping pattern? Uh, not really. Frankly, they don't care if you're a dog or you're, if you're a cat. As long as they predict that you're going to buy dog food next time, they will show you dog food, right? They don't know who actually you are and they uh, don't, don't care. Even the people who run the model, they perhaps don't, don't know uh, why they are set, recommending dog food to, to you either because the uh, machine did, did it all. All right. So as a matter of fact, you know, uh, for example, in this cartoon, right, if the, the, another user <laughs> you use this computer, uh, then uh, you your, uh, your thought that this user is a dog it simply is not accurate. Right? So uh, in the long run, in the long run, Understanding why, understanding who are actually using the computer, right? what, how the different people, different human or dog can use this computer. Understanding that reason right, will, in the long run, will help you uh, do, do your business, do, do your marketing. Right? But in the short run, when you have a good amount of data, you have capable uh, analytical knowledge to, and skills to uh, deal with this data, then big data is, uh, is a good tool. Right. So here I quote, uh, now uh, what is uh, big data's current place? Right. So although this is written in 2013, I think it's still true. Right. Uh, it's a, they uh, say it's a tool that doesn't offer ultimate answers, just good enough ones to help us now until better methods and has better answers come along. Right? We must use this tool with generous degree of humility and humanity. Right. I think that's good to say. Uh, they 
Big data are great tools, right? but uh, in order to make good use of this, they need to have uh, good masters uh, who know how to fight the war. Right? So uh, another exa example, yeah, today I have showed a lot of examples. Right? Uh, another one about uh, big data is uh, uh, a movie that uh, uh, I think it's an interesting movie. You can take a look. Right? It's called uh, uh, Brexit, the Uncivil War. Right. So in this uh, movie, one key uh, fact is that uh, they uh, they find uh, these three million people uh, using social media. Right. These people will say yes for leaving uh, for British to to leave EU, right. but they never vote. All right. So uh, in the movie, they highlight the fact that, that you know, social media was used to. Uh, find out these three million people, encourage them to to vote, then you know, make the leaving happen. Right? Well, that uh, uh, is about the power of big data. I agree. However, it largely missed the master of this weapon. Huh? You need to know. You need to to know that these there's a, a bunch of people right, who will say yes for leave, but they never vote. You need to know the social media is a way to get there. You need to know how to send a message that can encourage these people to say yes in the voting, All right? And those big data cannot help you do that because brick exit only happened once. There's no data for that. You need to understand why understand the reason behind all this to make it happen, right? And then the, another example, this is a me message. I, I like this a lot. So originally, uh, so their, this is their slogan. Originally the slogan was vote, leave, take control, right? So this is a core message they want to send. But then this smart guy, right? Then this is smart guy and say, well, I, I need to revise this slogan uh, to make it more powerful, right? Yes, I understand what people feel, right? So I, so I adding take back control, take back control, which makes this slogan a lot more powerful among the people uh, that they are targeting. Because adding back makes people think, hey, no, those control war ours originally. It's just a, it was taken because uh, British joined the EU and I want to take that control back. I had get a sense of ownership, right? a, a sense of entitlement. And I, because of the, that, that sense of entitlement and the a sense of ownership, I should go there and uh, vote yes for leaving. Right? That makes the message a lot more uh, powerful, but such kind of uh, idea you will never, well, uh, perhaps I should never say never, but very hard <laughs> to get from uh, machine learning method, um, big data, because there's no data exists. You cannot uh, afford to do experiment <laughs> over here, right? Uh, you, you, uh, uh, with no data, uh, your data, uh, data enabled method cannot tell you. Right. So you still need to use your smart brain to understand why and to create solutions uh, creatively. All right, so that is uh, about uh, big data. I, I, ho I hope uh, it, uh, first uh, you uh, get excited uh, about big data. At the same time, you will also have a better understanding of what big data can do and cannot do. Right. So for those who are interested in uh, this uh, marketing analytics career, I would recommend that you uh, not only now look at big data, data perhaps as a first step, you need to be a good master of the traditional uh, classical uh, method because that uh, uh, trains your analytical thinking a, a lot. Uh, uh, then you expand your uh, skill set right, to embrace the uh, power that new tools that uh, can, can bring you right? uh, because they are indeed good tools 
uh, in some of the field, right? and indeed very po very powerful. Right? Uh, but but no, still they they need you to uh, understand thoroughly what they can do and cannot do, what their pros and cons, how you bet best utilize those results. All these things uh, are are import, important. Right? As a hu human be being, our participation in this data uh, in this marketing analytics game is still critical. All right, um, so let's have, uh, in the end, have a brief uh, review of the entire course. All right. um, marketing analytics, all right, uh, it enable companies to do things that they were not able to do well in the past. Right? Uh, that includes you know, know your customer's secret even before they themselves do. Right? Uh, and based on that, being able to do more activities, then support your decision making through a, a marketing decision support system. Right? All these the marketing analytics can help you. And the expectation for the contemporary marketing analytics is higher and higher. Right? Uh, we are looking at uh, now understand the customer needs deeper at the individual level, you know, dynamic nature. Then we can take personal activity, uh, uh, take personalized actions for uh, each individual. Right? We can do that in real time, and all the decisions we, we make is not uh, now just uh, the light bulbs, but all. all evidence-based, right? That means scientific decision-making, right? And those uh, results can be optimized um, by uh, analyzing your input and output, finding the optimal level for, the, uh, uh, for your marketing target, right? So here is a, this expectation becomes higher and, and higher. Uh, the reality is, um, there are some leading companies that uh, uh, dominate the big data technology. <laughs> They're very fancy companies, There are only a few of them, but the majority of the companies still don't know where to go. The top level managers are eager, eager to embrace the digital age. The middle leverages, they are still not sure uh, where to go, how to, how to get there. And the operational level stuff is simply not trained to do that. Right? And that means a lot of opportunity for you. Right? If you can do this job, meet these expectations right? by having a good understanding of both marketing and analytics, then you have huge opportunity over here. Right? And uh, this course intends to start to prepare you on that uh, career path. Right? Um, so I hope you have uh, get an overview of the marketing analytics. Right? You, uh, you get a chance to design an analytical study right? and implement those tools to uh, get some uh, insights right? and translate those results into uh, managerial uh, in insights uh, to uh, can actually uh, be implemented to help managers. Right? Then you also uh, communicate those, those findings and the work, working teams to get, get the result. I hope that uh, you have uh, uh, experienced all, all this in this course and I uh, uh, hope, hope you find inspired to start your marketing analytics journey. All right. um, in terms of the topics and the models we learned in this, this course, uh, now the first one was regression, right? Uh, well, Logically speaking, you will find many things that are essentially regression, right? Because they're all about how I change one side of thing, the IVs, uh, independent variables, will lead to the change in the, uh, the other side of the equation, which is a dependent variable, right? All we try to, try to do here is set up this relationship. And you can see that logic, logic virtually applies to um, almost every method. Almost every method. Right? So uh, knowing the logic of regression is very, very important. Right? And we first uh, utilize this uh, logic uh, uh, regression uh, tool to understand the consumer preferences. 
including now using their survey or transaction data right, to find out uh, uh, their preference or a conjoint study, which where we also use a regression to find out patterns, right? Patterns is also about uh, how people like each of the feature levels, right? Um, so then based on that, we can optimize our product design, optimize, you know, uh, for example, how much we should sell the coffee bean, right? Uh, all this we can get, all those are the insights we can get from those regressions. And the uh, logics of uh, using this or all, all this data to uh, understand the people's preference is nicely pictured. Uh, by these, right? So we need to understand the people's uh, purchase procedure, right? how they make decisions, and then utilize different stages in this, this decision. We can get some measure, right? For example, perceptual measure, it's about their intention, right? Uh, behavior measure about what they do. If you happen to be a B2B business case, you can even objectively calculate those, uh, those value, right? So all these, um, uh, measures at a different stage can help uh, get, uh, get a sense, can help us understand their preference, help us understand why they buy. Right. Uh, model, now here I want to say a, a, a few uh, additional words about, about the uh, model, typical regression, right? So a model simplifies the real world problem. It picks out the key information from here. Right? For example, in this picture, right? Is this picture, what is interesting in there? Uh, well, it's, uh, uh, can you find, find some animal in there? It's a bit hard because uh, the color makes all this noisy, right? But I need a few lines to circle this. Now this could be a very simple model and with these are a few lines outlining this. It's very, much easier for us to find this lizard over here. Right? Lizard is a useful information here. And with the help of a simple uh, model, we can discover that. The model is trying to remove the, all the other noise over here and find the key insights. In a regression model, now we are ignoring all these errors, right? The errors are all the noise over here. And the uh, key regression, uh, regression equation is uh, key insights, uh, is a model. So a few lines we draw here, right? Uh, the key information we try to find. A model in order to, uh, for, uh, for us to achieve that purpose, right? Should be, uh, should make things as simple as possible, but not simpler, right? So this is a nice saying. Uh, Actually, where, uh, where I searched it, uh, the owner, ownership of this uh, saying was uh, not a definitive. <laughs> Apparently, many people may have said that, uh, but uh, typically people will say, you know, uh, Albert Einstein said that because he's one of the most famous, uh, he's most famous one. Uh, so if uh, he was the one said that, it makes this <laughs> more powerful. <laughs> So uh, and anyway, uh, no, this saying is great. Uh, no, let's assume El Albert Einstein said that. <laughs> um, so uh, finding insights, right, um, rely on wisdom. That's another comment I'd like to make. Right. Uh, because, uh, you, we all see the same result, but uh, whether uh, we can draw useful insights from there is uh, is a question mark. Right. For example, uh, insignificant result. Right. So uh, is a, here is a story uh, by about Sherlock Holmes. Right. Uh, uh, so it's from the story uh, Silver uh, Blaze, uh, the dog that didn't bark. Right. So this other detective uh, Gregory says, "Is there any other point to which you would wish to draw my attention?" Then Homer said, no, to the curious incidents of the dog in the nighttime. Then Gregory says, no, the dog did nothing in the nighttime. Homer said, no, that was a curious incident. That did nothing was exactly the interesting point. So 
why why did the, did Homer say that? Because uh, uh, if there's uh, some stranger, the dog should do something, should bark, right? But the uh, uh, dog didn't do anything. What well, that actually leads to uh, uh, is a very helpful information and leads to very useful knowledge here. Right? Again, uh, when you see an insignificant result, many people are not just to throw it away. Right? It's, it's insignificant. We don't know if it's different from zero or, or not. Uh, but it can possibly uh, miss out some information. If maybe you have a variable that should be significant, right? They, then see that significance. What does that mean? Maybe then there's something wrong with your data collection. Maybe mean it means there's uh, uh, very, uh, very several segments that are existing in your uh, population. Uh, you should separate them instead of modeling in the current way. These are all very useful information. Right? So you cannot simply uh, drop an insignificant result. You need to be smart. Uh, understand why uh, in order to capture the useful information. Um, then uh, we talk about, uh, we first talk about what kind of value customer wants, right? And then we also talk about what can, uh, kind of value can customers bring to a firm, right? Uh, we calculate the customer lifetime value, right? It includes economical value, which part can be calculated and some relationship value, right? which so far we are not uh, able to quantify them very well. Right? But when you are able to quantify this uh, value in some way, then you can also calculate it. Now you can use the same way we calculate the customer lifetime value to calculate the relationship value as well. Right? So if we can do that, it will lead to a, a better a calculation of customer lifetime value. Then we talk about the, after we deal with customers, the, uh, customer values, right? Uh, in the first session, we deal with values. After we do that, we start with the strategy part, right? And one base for marketing strategy is you treat uh, customers, you see customer difference and uh, utilize that uh, heterogeneity. Right. So we talk about segmentation, right? segmentation based on people's needs. That's needs based segment. Right? So base variables help us understand the customer's uh, needs, how that is different across different customers. And the descriptors helps us to find out who the customers are in each segment. And uh, if I want to find them and target them, how to do that. Right? So, uh, and we uh, also uh, introduce uh, this class analysis, right? Hierarchical, hierarchical class anal analysis help us uh, get an initial understanding of the uh, how people should be grouped. Right? Then some more precise uh, method. After we understand how many clusters we want to uh, 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 to classify, right? So then uh, we can use this uh, PAM method uh, to get a, a more precise classification. Well, this is an example right, of you uh, using um, this uh, uh, needs-based seg segment concept to classify right, people into four segments based, based on people's heterogeneous uh, needs over there. Right? And we talk, uh, talk about when we are at different locations on this GE portfolio map. Right? So uh, on one hand is your competitive strength. On the other hand is market attractiveness. Right? Uh, when you identify uh, different segments, it does not mean uh, you can just uh, go wherever segment you, uh, you want to go. <laughs> uh, that is not right because you need to uh, examine yourself as well. Do I have a good match between my firm and the segment I want to go in? Right? So you may find, for example, the new PDA market, the consumer, uh, uh, this uh, tech, uh, te tech uh, the innovator, right? So, so who, who wants high tech tech very much, you may find this segment very attractive. But look, you know, you are a company who are good at making industrial level PDA, now then you uh, perhaps 
uh, th there lies a very high risk for you to enter consumer uh, this first segment. Right? I'm not saying you, uh, you are not able to do that, but it takes a longer way right, for you to get in, in there. You perhaps need to redesign your product, redesign your distribution system, redesign your entire marketing team to, to go there. Right? Perhaps you want to start a new company <laughs> to, to deal with that. Right? And now, now you may have different competitors in that segment as well. So analyzing all these, you need to think about your strengths and the market attractiveness. And when you're target segment is located in different areas. Now you may have different marketing strategies to deal with that. Um, then we talk about the market response models, right? We uh, spend one session on how to uh, deal with uh, price curve. Uh, this uh, demand, uh, the demand curve, right? demand versus price. Then we also spend time on this uh, uh, ad, ad budget model, right? how your marketing is expenditures like in advertisement leads to a sales level change. change. Both of them, you can see them as a market response model because the logic here is the same. It's all about you putting some input. Uh, you have different product price, advertising sales effort as input. Then this model can help you predict what kind of output will be, right? then utilize that uh, model output. You can, um, you, you can optimize your solution, uh, optimize your input in order to get the uh, best outcome. Right? So uh, that, that way this uh, market response uh, model system that actually marketing decision-making support system, right? decision, su decision support system. And we talk about the three goals um, people have for marketing analytics, right? The last one is to build up a, a marketing decision support system to help you make decision. And the marketing response model is such kind of system here. Right? So the loop close. Right? Uh, in details, we talk about the demand curve and the elasticity. We also talk about the ad budget model. And these are different directions, right? Uh, my demand curve will uh, decrease as your market variable price increase. Right? On the other hand, this add a budget response function when you mark the input uh, variable increase, they should increase. So these two uh, models, they deal with these two directions. Right? One is going down, one is go going up. But uh, like the input like advertisement sales force, now those, all these marketing variables could lead to demand increase. Now, ad budget model is very useful for most of them. Right. So basically we talk about two types of model to deal with marketing strategies response. Um, such a market response model, once we get it, we can simulate market reactions, right? When we change price, what will happen? When we change our advertisement input, what will happen? Right? Then we can optimize our marketing strategy, strategies, help us allocate resources across different marketing activities. Right? Um, and uh, uh, this uh, a side effect, uh, which is also, also very important is that uh, uh, such a market response model sy system will encourage a systematic thinking in the, in, among the team and easily build consensus. Right? If you ever worked in a company for real, you will know now getting consensus, persuading people is uh, uh, a big job, right? a big, big job to do. Uh, making sure people are on the same page is sometimes uh, a very difficult job. But if you can set up such a, such a model system, now, um, because it's very hard to argue with model, argue with data, right? Imp that's where the uh, empirical uh, result is very powerful. Right? No one argues with, with, with them. So you can easily um, help, help you build your team consensus a lot easier. Um, then we talk about some latest development, right? In, uh, include, including um, some online advertising. Right? We uh, focused on paper click analysis, which is uh, mainstream advertising uh, 
new type, new version of advertising nowadays. We also talk about associate anal analysis, you know, market basic analysis, and the text analytics, right, which helps us deal with uh, different types of data. And today we talk about the maximums for uh, big data to work. Right? We identified the six elements over here. Right? Um, and uh, uh, well, that is uh, pretty much all uh, from this course. So before I conclude and uh, I wish you best, uh, good luck, uh, can you uh, let me know if you have any questions or comments? Any uh, final discussion you would like to uh, make? No, of course you, uh, you know, I will have uh, consultations this week and uh, next week as well. Uh, so if you still have a question or things you want to discuss with me, uh, happy, happy to. Uh, so if you don't have any qu question, oh, thank, thank you. Uh, yeah, if you don't have a question, let me wish you good luck with your final exams and uh, best wish for your future career. Uh, and remember now, uh, even after you leave this this course in the future, now if you want to uh, discuss with me um, in terms of marketing analytics, uh, you are welcome to do so. As a matter of fact, just a few weeks ago, uh, I have a former student who now get a job. They uh, they are running a start a startup a company. Uh, they they were puzzled by um, by uh, uh, allocating uh, advertisement resources across different adver advertising channels, and uh, he come uh, come back and uh, to discuss with me. Uh, it was uh, uh, pleasant to to see that they are using the things they learn from this course. Uh, uh, as a teacher, you uh, you know. Uh, it's uh, it's actually a delightful experience to see that uh, the thing I teach is actually used. <laughs> uh, that, that's that's great, and you're also welcome to do so in the future. All right. Uh, so that will be all for uh, this course. Thank you again, and I wish you all the best. <laughs>